Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, session. This was uh, actually started fortuitously in the sense uh, I happened to listen to Farhan talk some time ago and I really didn't understand it. Then I said, Param, you have to make this even simpler. And he said, yes, I will. And then finally today worked out. He said, let's have a session. Um, uh, it was originally supposed to be for my unit, but then I said, why only my unit? Let everybody benefit. And as I was saying before, uh, uh, everybody is benefiting, but not my unit people because they're not here. So, so most of you, if not all of you know Dr. Faran. Uh, Dr. Faran Shaikh is a senior consultant uh, uh, and head of the pediatric intensive care unit at Rainbow Children's Hospital in Banjara Hills, Hyderabad, the, the main branch in Hyderabad. Uh, he's an excellent teacher. Uh, it's a very, you know, he's really worked hard at several projects uh, with the intensive care chapter uh, previously. He's uh, very well known for his insights into quality control in the ICU and he's an NABH assessor. And I always keep uh, telling people that if I really, really hate somebody, I will send Parhan to go and inspect their unit. Okay, <laughs> because he's very difficult to satisfy. <laughs> so, um, um, so Nirmal, maybe I'll send Parhan to inspect your unit there. Okay. <laughs> No, I don't, I'm just joking. So, but what is also coming about is Farhan has been speaking more and more about driving pressure and, uh, you know, respiratory mechanics and all of those things. And so, uh, you know, I hope he can, at the end of this session, we'll all have a better understanding uh, of, uh, um, of the topic. So without further ado, Farhan, uh, thank you for, uh, uh, offering to do this talk, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for that kind uh, introduction, sir. Can you see my screen, sir? Yeah. So uh, today's discussion is on ventilator-induced lung injury with a special emphasis on a role of driving pressure and mechanical power in pediatric ventilation. I'm going to have a very brief introduction to the recent concepts of ventilator induced or ventilator associated lung injury, followed by a concept of stress and strain, driving pressure, and then mechanical power. As we know, ventilator or ventilation induced or associated lung injury, can I request everybody to mute themselves, please? So, as you know, ventilator or ventilation-induced or associated lung injuries result from the interaction between what the ventilator delivers to the lung parenchyma and how the lung parenchyma accepts it. So, historically, uh, parotrauma was first recognized in 1973 and then in 1988, Ritter Dreyfus uh, came up with that landmark article where he showed that polytrauma is more harmful than barotrauma. Then in around 1997, we came to know about atelect trauma and biotrauma roughly in that period. And then from 2015, 2016 onwards, there was a discussion on ergotrauma with the concepts of stress, strain, and then impact of energy and uh, driving pressures. So this was the timeline of ventilator-induced lung injury and our understanding. So on one side, we have ventilator load of pressure, volume, rates, and eye time. And on the other side, we have conditions within the lung parenchyma with that is compliance, resist, airway resistance, percentage of recruitable lung, et cetera. So the ventilator generated causes of uh, injury are pressure, volume, flow, inspiratory time, and respiratory rate. While the lung conditions which can predispose to injury are amount of edema, which can decrease the lung dimensions, which we call as baby lung. Uh, increase in homogeneity in, in, in homogeneity in the lung, increase of the stress risers and cyclical collapse and decollapse. For clarity, we are going to neglect a discussion on extra pulmonary factors such as multi-organ dysfunction, perfusion to the lungs, coagulopathy, hemodynamics, and blood gas uh, abnormalities and temperature abnormalities. We all know about lung protective ventilation, which is 
keeping the platy pressures below 28 centimeters of water, low tidal volume and high peep strategy. And that is collectively known as lung protective ventilation. And as I said, the first came up with this suggestion that it was volutrauma, which was more harmful than barotrauma in 1988. And in year 2000, ArtsNet trial suggested low tidal volume ventilation was more safe compared to high tidal volume. Uh, many of our present generation students may not be aware that adult ventilation was using 15 ml per kg tidal volume as a routine tidal volume in 1995-96 era. And then everybody started ventilating at 6 ml per kg of predicted body weight, assuming lungs to be something like this after the ArtsNet recommendation. <coughs> However, as we know, truth can be stranger than fiction. In moderate to severe ARDS, we can have only 50 or 60% or even 40% lung available to take up the tidal volume. So if we uh, calculate 6 ml per kg tidal volume and push that volume in this kind of lung, which is only 40 or 50%, that is the baby lung, and uh, then you can imagine how much the pressure in the system will increase. In fact, even in normal lungs, Jimula et al. showed that from 50 to 75 to 80 kilo body weight, the gas volume may be similar or comparable. That means if you take a per kg body weight of a, a, for a 70 to 80 kilo person and ventilate, you, can, you will end up instilling a lot of volume in that lung, uh, although his gas volume is equal to what a 50 kilo person has. So all in all, if you push large volume in a smaller capacity lungs, you will end up causing volume trauma. You will end up increasing the pressure in the system. And those pressures are mainly platy pressure and uh, driving pressure. And uh, that's why at the bedside, if we monitor these pressures and keep them under safe zone, indirectly, we will ensure that we are not instilling too much of volume in the baby lung. And this brings us to the main discussion today, that is the Amato's uh, paper, uh, which was published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2015 about driving pressure. The authors hypothesized that titrating the tidal volume to the available respiratory compliance or baby lung using the ratio of tidal volume to respiratory compliance as an index indicating the functional size of the lung would provide a better predictor of outcomes in ARDS compared to using tidal volume per kg body weight. So basically what they said is take tidal volume uh, titrate it as per available respiratory compliance rather than taking tidal volume per kg body weight and they call it as driving pressure. Now the question is if it is tidal volume delivered as per available lung compliance why are we calling it driving pressure where is the pressure here then. So for this we need to just look at this equation once again it is VT divided by respiratory compliance which is driving pressure and as we know respiratory compliance is nothing but change in volume that is tidal volume divided by change in pressure that is Platy pressure minus positive and expiratory pressure. And uh, if we replace respiratory compliance with this, then we will have this VT cancelled and we will be left with driving pressure is equal to platy pressure minus PEEP. So driving pressure at the bedside can be measured by taking difference between platy pressure minus PEEP. But in reality, driving pressure is tidal volume titrated as per the available respiratory compliance. This is very important for us all to understand and uh, that is why driving pressure is considered to be an important tool for titration of tidal volume, although people use driving pressure for peep titration also, but it is fundamentally a volume uh, tidal volume uh, titration tool. So we have a peep, plateau minus peep, that is at the bedside, we measure it as driving pressure, which is actually VT by respiratory compliance. In Amato study, they had divided their patient population into three uh, groups. The first group had constant positive industrial pressure with increasing driving pressure. As driving pressure is increasing, that means the tidal volume in the system in the lungs is in increasing. That means the strain is increasing. And the second population had constant driving pressure with rising positive industrial pressure. As driving pressure or tidal volume is constant, the strain is constant. And the third group where the plateau pressure was fixed at 28 centimeters of water and positive industrial pressure is increasing. That is why the driving pressure is decreasing and decreasing driving pressure means that tidal volume is reducing. That means the strain is decreasing. So when the strain is increasing, the mortality is increasing. When the strain does not increase, there, are, there is no change in the mortality. And when the strain is reducing, you see a reduction in the mortality. And this last part of Amato's uh, study is the important thing uh, which we are going to discuss further. That means you, it is not just keeping driving pressure in the safe zone. You also need to have a well titrated positive industrial pressure 
and make sure that your platelet pressure is less than 28 to achieve a good outcome to reduce the mortality. They also showed that driving pressure above 15 to 16 centimeters of water increases the odds ratio of ventilator in this lung injury significantly. But even if you increase tidal volume from 6 to 12 ml per kg, the odds of ventilator in this lung injury does not increase as long as driving pressure is in safe zone. This is again an interesting thing to understand. As we already saw, if you have a lung like this with normal compliance, that means if the lung has more capacity to take more volume, you can increase in this lung tidal volume from 6 to 12 ml per kg and driving pressure may remain within normal range and there will be hardly any ventilator in this lung injury. But in the other side, on the right side, you have a severe ARDS and small capacity now, small baby lung. And in this case, if you try to increase more tidal volume, you will end up having driving pressure in the danger zone and you will have more ventilator in this lung injury. Thus, lungs with poor respiratory compliance should be ventilated with lower tidal volume and lungs with good respiratory compliance can be ventilated at higher tidal volumes as long as driving pressure is in the safe zone. So it is not just keeping your platy pressure below 28 centimeters of water, but also it is the cyclical deformation, the opening and closing of the alveoli, which is also harmful. And as we can see, this has to be at the, will be related with the respiratory rate also. So at higher respiratory rate or over a longer duration, this cyclic lung deformation will cause more ventilator in this lung injury. And that is why there is the importance of respiratory rate. Lung safe study, which was published next year, confirmed the findings of Marcelo Amato, that is driving pressure above 15 was associated with mortality. They found that uh, higher driving pressure above 14 centimeters of water was associated with increased hospital mortality in moderate to severe ARDS. They could not find this association in mild ARDS. One drawback of using only driving pressure in isolation is that it doesn't take into account the role of positive end extreme pressure. And we can imagine you may have a uh, technically normal driving pressure of 10 or 12, but uh, still if you are applying that driving pressure over a harmful peep of zero or uh, say 20 centimeters of water, still you will uh, end up having ventilator induced lung injury. So you need to know at what peep you are applying this driving pressure. And second thing is role of auto peep. If you have a significant auto peep because of increased airway resistance, then again, uh, your uh, driving pressure will be overestimated. This brings us to the important uh, topic of how to measure driving pressure accurately. And this is impacted by underlying positive index pressure as we discussed, auto peep overestimates. Similarly, a peep must be set above the airway opening pressure. I'm not going to discuss more of airway opening pressure in this talk because this is a very interesting and a different thing. Uh, airway opening pressure is more important in obesity and uh, uh, patients with ascites or intra-abdominal hypertension. And in those cases, uh, the peep has to be set above the airway opening pressure. If it is below that, then uh, again, there will be underestimation of the driving pressure. Similarly, too high and too, peep, uh, too low peep also, as we discussed, will uh, affect impact the measurement of driving pressure. Second thing is you need to accurately measure platy pressure. We will discuss in the next slides. Also, we need to know at what tidal volume we are uh, having this particular driving pressure because some clinicians may try to keep driving pressure in the safe zones by ventilating at low tidal volumes. And if the tidal volume is too low, that will expose the patient to atelect trauma. And then degree of airway resistance is also important because the studies have shown that if there is increased airway resistance or a narrow endotracheal tube, it will drop the platy pressure. And uh, again, it will affect the measured driving pressure. And then presence of spontaneous breathing uh, as all, also known as the patient self-infected lung injury. As we all know, when there is a spontaneous breathing, there is also a risk of high driving pressure and volume trauma. In this talk, I'm not going to discuss but this particular aspect. So uh, coming to now accurate measurement of platy pressure and positive end expiratory pressure, it will depend upon what mode of ventilator we are using. As we know, in volume control mode, we have a simple uh, constant flow with a zero flow and platy pressure will be continuously displayed on the monitor. But in pressure control mode, we have decelerating flow. Hence, there is no automatic zero flow. So now we need to create a zero flow. This can be done by either keeping a long eye time so if you have a sufficiently long eye time where your inspiratory flow is touching the baseline, you will have a zero flow and platy pressure will uh, be almost equal to peak insp inspiratory pressure. 
or you will have to apply an inspiratory hold in pressure control mode to achieve a zero flow and then pretty pressure will be equal to peak inspiratory pressure. So in volume control mode, the things are very straightforward. You have to simply, uh, this is a volume control mode and you just need to apply three to five seconds of inspiratory hold and uh, you will get a, a plenty pressure displayed. And uh, this is in volume control mode. But uh, in pressure control mode, as I said, uh, you need to have either a long eye time so that the flow touches the baseline and then you get a zero flow and automatically your plenty pressure will be equal to PIP. But in moderate to severe ARDS in sicker patients, you may not be always able to have such kind of luxury of having such long eye times. So then you are left with the other option where you just apply an inspiratory hold and achieve a zero flow and then plenty pressure can be calculated. So it is just like volume control mode. So this patient is in pressure control mode, same patient who we saw in volume control mode had a plenty pressure of 15 centimeters of water. So now the same patient we took in pressure control mode and apply an inspiratory hold of three to five seconds. And after three to five seconds, we see a plenty pressure. And as we can see, as the patient is same, the plenty pressure is again same. So in both pressure control and volume control, we got the same plenty pressure of 15 centimeters of water. So this is how we need to accurately measure uh, plenty pressure. This is a recent study by Bhavesh Patel and uh, Nadi Jaya, uh, where they did a correlation of this by in a decelerating flow pattern that is in PRBC mode and pressure control mode uh, between the plenty pressure and PIP. And they found that when you achieve a zero flow by inspiratory hold, you, you will have a good correlation between plenty pressure and PIP. So they have validated this particular strategy. Coming to PIP titration, that we have lower and upper inflection points. And normally uh, this is a zone of de-recruitment and this is a zone of over-recruitment. So normally what we do is we start with a PIP of like five or six, and then we go on increasing the positive and restricted pressure. Uh, and uh, we stop at a point where we get uh, best compliance, best oxygenation, best hemodynamic stability, and uh, least driving pressure. This is generally which we do, and this is how we titrate the PEEP. Uh, uh, normally, most of the time, this is the most popular way of uh, titration of PEEP at the bedside using PV loop. And uh, the only problem uh, with this uh, technique is you are basically in increasing the positive interest pressure and stopping somewhere in between here. So you are basically titrating the PEEP on the inspiratory limb of the pressure volume loop. However, the positive end expiratory pressure by the name itself is an expiratory pressure. And that's why uh, it is also felt that this positive end expiratory pressure is actually operating during expiration and uh, should be titrated during expiration rather than during inspiratory limb of the pressure volume loop. And this can be achieved by performing a recruitment maneuver using incremental PEEP and then titrating the PEEP in deflation limb. So as I said, normally we are doing inspiratory, we are doing a PEEP titration during the inspiratory limb, but the other strategy can be you go on increasing the PEEP till your PIP reaches 30 or 40 centimeters of water. Generally in pediatrics, we keep 30 centimeters of water, stay there for 30 seconds and then start coming down. When, when you're bringing the PEEP down, you will titrate it somewhere on the deflation limb uh, where you have best uh, compliance, best oxygenation, best hemodynamic stability, and best driving pressure. So that will be a PEEP titration on the deflation limb after recruitment maneuver using incremental PEEP. Of course, you have to be very careful in selecting patients. It is not recommended for all patients. So it is only for those where the lungs are recruitable, hemodynamically stable patients. There are other uh, prerequisites for that. So to understand this, they has, we have this illustration at zero PEEP, the lung will be totally collapsed like this. And at lower inflection point, lung will be somewhere like this. Suppose if we have titrated the PEEP at say 10 centimeters of water. So this is the lung, which will look like this at a titrated PEEP of 10 on the inspiratory limb of the pressure volume loop. Then we have upper inflection point uh, where your lung is quite distended now. And then you have a uh, at the at the peak, that means around 30 centimeters of water, you have over distended lung. And then during expiration, when you're titrating the PEEP and you reduce uh, the PEEP gradually, you will ha have a point, particular point that is called as upper inflection point on the deflation limb, where you have suppose titrated the PEEP somewhere here. 
where the lung will look something like this. So the peep may be the same at 10 centimeters of water, but you can see there is clearly difference in the size of the lung. The lung which was titrated on the inspiratory limb is quite small as compared to much better recruited uh, lung uh, after doing the recruitment maneuver by incremental peep titration followed by peep titration uh, on the deflation limb. So uh, this is a much better uh, peep which will sustain the alveoli in open state during expiration over a longer period of time compared to this as the study suggested. So uh, we need to also understand the impact of recruitability, with, uh, whether the lung is recruitable or not on the driving pressure. So in any moderate to severe ARDS patients, there are three distinct zones. You have baby lung, they have, you have completely atelectatic lung, and you have an intermittent uh, so-called recruitable lung where with peep titration or by recruitment maneuver, you can open these alveoli. And uh, it depends upon how much recruitable lung you have. If you have good amount of recruitable lung, then this lung will absorb the energy and uh, you will have less impact of mechanical energy or mechanical power and less of ventilator induced lung, inju lung injury in these cases. And because it will be able to absorb uh, the extra pressure and energy, uh, you, there will be some drop also in the pressures uh, once you do a recruitment. Similarly, if you have a situation where your recruitable lung is very small, then there is a very less buffer to absorb the energy and more risk of uh, ventilator induced lung energy lung in injury so for example in this example we have a patient with a peep of 8 and plenty pressure of 22 so driving pressure is 22 minus 8 that is 14 and we suppose uh, want to increase the peep from 8 to say 12 and the lung is supposed not recruitable so we will have a situation because the lung is not recruitable, plenty of pressure going to the unsafe zone of 28 and driving pressure going to unsafe zone of 16. But suppose if we have a recruitable lung, then the same increment of P from 8 to 12 will achieve a plenty of pressure of safer level of 22 and driving pressure also will be safer at around 10. So this means a recruitable lung. So when you have a recruitable lung, when you increase the PEEP, you will see some reduction in the driving pressure and the plenty pressure. This is an indication that the lung is recruitable. But the students should not get confused or misled with this. This does not mean that driving pressure should be used for PEEP titration all, 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 all the way. As I said already, driving pressure is basically a volume, what, tidal volume, which is titrated for the available respiratory compliance. You can use it for peep titration, there's no problem with that, but you need, need to keep a watch on what tidal volume you are uh, selecting that particular driving pressure and uh, prevent problems of uh, uh, volume trauma or atelect trauma. And this was actually very beautifully uh, demonstrated in this paper by Paulo Pulisi, where they, found, they compared the uh, impact of same tidal volume on driving pressure and stress index in different situations. So when you've got a very bad uh, ARDS, very poor compliance and very poor aeration, very poor recruitment potential, you will have high driving pressure and very high stress index. While you have, suppose, moderate uh, uh, recruitment potential, you have driving pressure, unsafe zone, but not very high and stress index also high, but manageable. And if you have modest loss of aeration, driving pressure will be in safe zone and stress index also will be in safe zone. And suppose if you have very high uh, hyper aeration because of excess amount of peep, suppose unnecessary high peep, then again you have hyperinflation and uh, leading to very high driving pressure and high stress index. So the situation of driving pressure keeps changing depending upon what kind of lung you have and you need to understand which type of lung you're ventilating and how you're titrating your driving pressure. And as, as uh, we understood with this is the driving pressure is more suited for tidal volume titration or uh, depending on the available uh, lung compliance can be used for titration of PEEP, but you need to keep a watch on what volume you're using. So a good lung with, res a, a lung with good respiratory compliance, you can ventilate with higher volumes as long as your driving pressures are safe. Lungs with poor compliance, ventilate at lower tidal volumes as long as your driving pressures are safe. So if, you, if the lungs are bad you, and your patient is stable and suitable for recruitment maneuver, you may go ahead and do a recruitment maneuver by incremental peep and, peep and then followed by peep titration on the deflation limb. And then after that, select a smaller tidal volume which suits you and uh, ventilate this patient. 
uh, so this is what has been described by the third group of amato study but so far we don't know a sim single safe tidal volume value in pediatric ERDS, but the general consensus is do not ventilate with tidal volumes more than 10 ml. So your tidal volume has to be less than 10 ml per kg, whatever uh, may be the situation. And in mild ARDS, you may ventilate with little higher uh, tidal volume because the compliance is good at a six, or six to eight ml per kg. But when the compliance is poor and your bloody pressures are hitting 28 centimeters of water, you may come down with the tidal volume of around four ml per kg also. In pressure control mode, actually, we are using this concept uh, of lung, productive, lung protection automatically. We had this discussion last week when uh, Dr. Shekhar sir and Dr. Uh, Martin Neighbor sir were uh, making their presentation. So in a pressure control mode, you have fixed your peak inspiratory pressure or plateau pressure. And uh, then even if it is a poor compliance lung or a good compliance lung, the, the peak pressure is not going to go beyond this. 28, for example, if you have fixed this at 28. So if there is a poor lung compliance, as the pressure is fixed, the tidal volume delivery will automatically small, become smaller if the lung compliance is poor. And if the lung compliance is good, the tidal volume delivery automatically will increase uh, if the compliance is better. So this takes care of itself automatically in pressure control mode. Same thing is not going to happen in PRVC mode. In PRVC mode, you are going to select a tidal volume, say five or six ml per kg. And if the patient has got very poor lung compliance and size of baby lung is very small, that six ml per kg tidal volume itself can be too much for that lung and cause volume trauma. So that's the thing. And uh, 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 this strategy basically suits the Amato's uh, last uh, third group, where, as we said, we titrate the PEEP optimally, keep small driving pressure, that means the low, small tidal volume basically, and fix the plateau pressure uh, to 28 and don't allow it to go above 28. So in pressure control mode, you achieve all these three things automatically. And uh, now finally, we'll look at the impact of airway resistance. This was the study which Dr. Martin Neighbor had uh, done uh, in uh, uh, prospective study. They had uh, found that if it increased airway resistance, there is a drop in plateau pressure. So the plateau pressure reaching the alveoli will be lower than the plateau pressure measured outside. This is interesting. So with the shorter eye time, where the flow is not reaching the baseline and you are not achieving a zero flow or smaller size of endotracheal tube, or if you have increased airway resistance, all these factors will bring down the plateau pressure delivery to the alveolar level. So uh, now coming to the last uh, important uh, caveat or drawback, which was mentioned in the editorial of the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, where the Amato's article was published, and that was they did not take Amato uh, at all, did not take into consideration the importance of chest wall elastance and transpulmonary pressure. So they were calculating driving pressure, taking plateau pressure minus positive end expiratory pressure, but that plateau pressure and uh, positive end expiratory pressure will uh, change depending upon chest wall elastance. And this uh, basically brings us to this important discussion that if you, a person has a normal chest wall elastance, uh, no chest wall edema, no obesity, no ascites, no pleural effusions, then you are, if you are applying a plateau pressure of say 30 centimeters of water, uh, 25 centimeters of water will be spent in expanding the lungs and just five centimeters will be used up to elevate the chest wall. And in such a situation, your transpulmonary pressure will be somewhere around 21 to 24 centimeters of water. Transpulmonary pressure is a pressure which is actually imparted on the alveoli. It is calculated by taking difference between plateau pressure and the pleural pressure. And pleural pressure is indirectly calculated by measuring the esophageal pressure by inserting a probe in the lower one third of the esophagus. Now, there are some caveats and uh, drawbacks to this technique. We will not be discussing that here. But that's how it is done. The probe is placed in the esophagus, in the lower one third of the esophagus. That pressure is equal to pleural pressure, it is assumed. And then you take plateau pressure minus pleural pressure and calculate transpulmonary pressure. That is also known as stress. In a patient who has got a chest wall edema or ascites or massive pleural effusion or intra abdominal hypertension, situation will change. Now, if you applied a plateau pressure of 30 centimeters of water, 15 centimeters of water or 50% of that pressure will be spent in overcoming that chest wall edema or intraabdominal hypertension. And hardly 15 centimeters of water or 50% of that pressure will be used up in expanding the lungs. 
and this will ultimately correspond to transplanar pressure may be as low as just 6 to 10 centimeters of water. So this is the importance of uh, taking con into consideration of this chest wall elastance. Indeed, in 2008 study of Chimulo, they demonstrated that airway platy pressure of 30 centimeters of water can have a transplanar pressure of just 10 centimeters of water to even 28 centimeters of water. So there can be so much disparity and that's why it is so important to measure transpulmonary pressure. And this brings us to the concept of stress and strain. Stress is, as we discussed, is nothing but uh, the difference between platy pressure and pleural pressure, also known as transpulmonary pressure. Stress is basically the pressure applied per uh, unit surface area, and it leads to strain. That means stretching and change in volume. So strain is the change in volume divided by initial volume. So basically strain is tidal volume divided by initial volume that is functional residual capacity and stress and strain are related directly so stress is equal to k into strain and k is the lung specific elastic that is the amount of pressure required to double the lung volume or the volume of the baby lung so if we have a scenario where you are ventilating with a so-called normal tidal volume of 6 ml per kg on a certain frc and in another patient you increase the frc by peep titration or by recruitment maneuver or by prone positioning by all those things you increase the frc and the tie volume is same 6 ml per kg but as you can see if by increasing the frc you are actually increasing the denominator of the equation of strain that means you are technically mathematically reducing the strain so the same uh, tidal volume of 6 ml per kg when applied at higher frc will lead to lesser strain as compared to same tidal volume applied at lower FRC. So it is not just about what tidal volume you are using 5 ml or 6 ml per kg, but you need to also keep in mind at what FRC you are applying. And that is the importance of uh, having a good peep or a good uh, uh, aerated lung. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have a good FRC, you are not going to have the benefit of uh, having only low tidal volume. And that's what uh, we will see in this illustration. At zero peep, you have a certain FRC and you are having a tidal ventilation, delivering a certain tidal, tidal volume. So the strain is a ratio of VT by FRC as we already saw. And this is our total lung capacity. Total lung capacity is normally 2.5 to 3 times the FRC. And now suppose we have introduced a certain peep, like a healthy peep of 5 to 6 centimeters of water which has led to some increase in the FRC because PEEP is going to cause some alveolar recruitment. And this PEEP will also introduce some PEEP volume in the system. And by introduction of PEEP volume in the system, now you have end expiratory lung volume. So end expiratory lung volume is nothing but PEEP volume plus functional residual capacity. And you have now new equation for strain. The strain is now tidal volume plus PEEP volume divided by the FRC the total FRC, and this is the strain. And as we can see, uh, and uh, this is our end inspiratory lung volume, end inspiratory lung volume is safely away from total lung capacity. So there is no question of having any volume trauma, it is quite safely away from total lung capacity. So we can clearly see the characteristics of a healthy PEEP or good PEEP. A good PEEP increases the FRC, that is the denominator of the equation of strain and reduces the strain. It also has increased the numerator. So basically it is balancing out the equation of strain and it is causing alveolar recruitment. And by alveolar recruitment, if the blood supply or lung perfusion is good in that recruited area, it will also improve the oxygenation. And it is not causing any volume trauma because your end expiratory, inspiratory lung volume is safely away from total lung capacity. So these are all good characteristics of a healthy PEEP. But if you are applying too much of PEEP, then if you are applying too much of PEEP, the equation changes now. Now your numerator is very heavy. This is going to increase the strain in the system. And as we know now, because of too much of PEEP volume, as we can see, end inspiratory lung volume is almost touching the total lung capacity. If this patient is getting ventilated at 30 breaths per minute, that means 30 times in a minute, your uh, tidal volume is hitting the total lung capacity, leading to significant volume trauma. These are all characteristics of a bad PEEP. So bad PEEP will induce volume trauma as well as increase the static strain in the system. So PEEP has a U-shaped relationship rather than a linear relationship. Good PEEP prevents atelectrauma, trauma, keeps alveoli open and prevents cycling, opening and collapse of the alveoli, 
promoting surfactant production, while unhealthy PEEP will increase static strain and volume trauma. And you need to, need to understand that the lung in ARDS has a baby lung, totally atlactic lung and a recruitable part, but you cannot recruit 100% lung at, uh, in normal clinical situations. Studies have shown that even at uh, inflation pressures of 30 centimeters of water, 15 to 30% of the lung will still remain unrecruited and closed. And if you want to have 100% recruitment, that means you will have to apply very high unhealthy PEEP, which we don't want. And second important thing is only recruitment of alveoli will not improve oxygenation. Oxygenation will improve when the perfusion also improves in that area. This needs to be understood. So as we know, strain and stress are now linearly correlated with each other. And a strain of around 2 to 2.2 corresponds to stress of around 24 to 26 centimeters of water. So when we increase the stress, uh, stress pulmonary pressure or stress from 12 to 24, the strain enters into the danger zone of around 1.5 to 2. And uh, this is the place where pathophysiology, uh, uh, histopathologically, biotrauma starts with inflammation, edema, and microfractures. And uh, this is the pressure of this 24 centimeters of water of transpulmonary pressure roughly corresponds to the plateau pressure of around 28 to 30 centimeters of water in a normal person with normal chest wall elastins. That means if a person does not have chest wall edema, no obesity, no intra-abdominal hypertension, the plateau pressure of 28 corresponds to transpulmonary pressure of 24. And in such a patient, as per the uh, uh, lung protective strategy, if you keep plateau pressure less than 28, you will automatically keep your stress below 24 and strain below 1.6 or 1.5 and thus you will ventilate patients safely. That is the whole idea of keeping plateau pressure less than 28. However, uh, in uh, obese patients that, that won't apply. So higher strain will correspond to higher plateau pressure and higher stress and higher driving pressure. And uh, most of the times in, at the bedside, you can't monitor the strain, although there are some ventilators and techniques by which strain can be measured. But generally, we don't measure strain uh, in most of the cases. So in most of the cases, if you keep plateau pressures below 28 and driving pressures in the safe zones, you will end up having safe stress and strain in the lungs. But in children with obesity, chest wall edema, abdominal hypertension, and ascites, it's better uh, measure the pulmonary, cross pulmonary pressures because then that will be more accurate measurement of the pressures. Indeed, uh, there is one study which, which has shown that trans pulmonary driving pressure is a better strategy. That means instead of esophageal transducer, measure trans pulmonary inspiratory and expiratory pressure and calculate trans pulmonary driving pressure. And when you keep it below 10, it is a better strategy than measuring only P plus two minus P uh, positive end expiratory pressure. Now we'll just quickly go through the pediatric considerations. Pediatric studies on uh, driving pressures are very less. There is no study in pediatric age group to suggest that driving pressure guided ventilatory strategy actually improves the outcome. For pediatric studies, we need to also understand the concept of dynamic driving pressure because most of the pediatric patients are on pressure control or PRVC modes. And uh, uh, the studies in pediatric age group, particularly retrospective studies, you cannot apply an inspiratory hold retrospectively. So you have to take PIP minus PWP, and that is your uh, dynamic driving pressure. Basically, you are taking PIP minus PWP means you're including this airway resistance also. That's why you call it dynamic driving pressure. And there are two important studies. Uh, one study is by Abdul Rauf et al, where Dr. Shekhar sir was also one of the co-authors. And uh, one study is by uh, Nadir Yahya, in 2017, which used uh, the concept of dynamic driving pressure. So in Nadiri Haya study, they showed that higher dynamic driving pressure was associated with mortality at onset as well as at 24 hours, and lower driving pressure was associated with successful extubation. In um, the Abdurov study, uh, they uh, took dynamic driving pressure in PRVC mode. They took an adult cutoff of 15 centimeters of water and they found that mortality was higher when it was more than 15 centimeters of water. This was the study by Dr. Martin Neber and his team uh, recently published in, from 300 patients. This is a prospective study. So they performed an inspiratory hold in pressure control mode, calculated proper plateau pressure. They divided their patients into this kind of three uh, groups as Amato had done. And in their group, they found that only in the first group where the high driving pressure was there, they found uh, it was associated with the fever 28 days, ventilator three days. 
they used it 28 days ventilator three days as uh, outcome parameter because uh, according to them the first thing was the mortality in children anyway was lesser and uh, it was mortality was multifactorial so they used 28 days ventilator three days in their study the remaining two groups did not show uh, much correlation and uh, from driving pressure above 15 centimeters of water they found there was significant fall in the 28 days ventilator three days so they found the similar threshold of 15 centimeters of water and very interestingly in the same study uh, they also did a correlation of the classical driving pressure that is tidal volume divided by respiratory compliance with plutty minus p plutty minus p versus pip minus p and they found that vt divided by respiratory compliance which is the classical uh, driving pressure correlates better with the tube pressure minus p and they found that pip minus p overestimates the driving pressure actually so all in all in pressure control or prvc mode as far as possible we should not take pip as a surrogate for platy pressure perform an inspiratory hold and measure platy pressure properly or have a long inspiratory time allow the inspiratory flow to touch the baseline and then measure the platy pressure but for respiratory retrospective studies of course you don't have option so you may take a dynamic driving pressure there uh, this was uh, one interesting and important study actually i would say by chimulo et al they had done a similar study in adults in 2008 and they performed this study uh, in children in 2016, where they calculated end expiratory lung volume stress and strain in 20 children, 10 normal and 10 children with ARDS at two different peeps and three different tidal volumes. Uh, basically, there are differences in children and adults, and that we need to understand. In children, as the age increases, the compliance of the respiratory system and the lung significantly increases. And also, the important thing is the chest wall compliance decreases because of the ossification and changes in the ribcage configuration, particularly in the first three to five years of age. And as the chest wall contributes 30 to 35 percent to the total respiratory compliance, overall, there is increase in the respiratory system compliance as the child increases with age. Obviously, they found that the stress, strain, and the lung specific uh, elastins were all higher in children with ARDS compared to normal lung. That was not a problem. They found that end expiratory lung volume was significantly lower in ARDS patient. This was also expected, and it increased in both the groups with the application of PEEP. Chest wall compliance was similar in the two groups. This is, again, an interesting thing. So uh, it is not necessary that children will have chest wall edema. And this, the reason is also simple. In, in, the, in all those cases which they collected, they all had the direct ARDS. The children had pneumonia. So they had uh, normal chest wall compliance and pure ARDS, uh, direct ARDS basically. Compliance of the lung and chest wall was not affected by change in the PEEP or tidal volume. However, the stress and strain significantly increased with PEEP. And that's why they suggested that stress and strain could be used as a better indicator for possible VLE during mechanical ventilation. The lung stress, although related to airway driving pressure, could not be predicted by the driving pressure. That was an interesting finding. They actually found that driving pressure of 14 to 16 uh, corresponded to the lung stress anywhere between 13 to 25 centimeters of water. So there was hardly any uh, relationship. In adult study of their 2008 uh, analysis, they had found that transpulmonary pressure caused similar changes in the lung gas volume, suggesting similar lung specific uh, el el elastins. However, in children with ARDS, the specific lung elastins was significantly higher compared to control group. And just to re recap, this is the lung elast specific elastins as we discussed uh, in the previous slides. So this was significantly higher in children according to them. And why uh, this, uh, this is uh, this, the reason maybe because children are different, their lungs are structurally different, they are suggesting they are suggesting that in children's ERDS, inflammation may be more than what adults uh, face. Maybe there is a component of surfactant depletion or alteration and edema. So maybe these are the factors in children's ERDS uh, which uh, lead to all these things. And just like adults, they also found that uh, transpulmonary pressure was not really correlating with the platy pressure. They found that 30 centimeters of water of airway platy pressure was correlating with transplant pressure between 23 to 27 centimeters of water. So there was a wide swing. And they also found that tidal volume per kg body weight was also unpredictable uh, uh, because uh, 
the reduction in FRC itself was unpredictable in a pediatric ARDS. So all in all, this is an interesting study because this is the only study in children where stress strain on all these things were studied. Now we'll come to the last part of my talk that is the concept of mechanical power. Till now, we looked at all pressure parameters, driving pressure, P, plenty pressure, stress and strain. However, there are so many non-pressure parameters also like tidal volume, airway resistance, gas flow, IE ratio, respiratory rate, which also make an energy load. So this pressure as well as non-pressure energy loads when they are expressed as joules per unit of time, that is called mechanical power. And geometrically, uh, mechanical power is actually area under the volume and area under the pressure multiplied by respiratory rate. So this is the total triangle. Uh, on the left side, we have the representation by the volume, tidal volume and the peep volume. This is represented by the airway resistance. And the, on the top, we have representation by the pressure. So this is PEEP, this is your alveolar pressure, and this is our peak inspiratory pressure. The slope represents the compliance of the system. This is our driving pressure. If you rotate it by 90 degrees and compare it against the pressure time scalar, this is our PEEP, and uh, this corresponds to PIP. This corresponds to plenty pressure. This is our driving pressure. And this is our alveolar pressure. And this slope basically corresponds to the compliance of the system. And as I said, uh, mechanical power is the area under the volume and area under the pressure multiplied by respiratory rate. So when you take this total area in this equation, this particular part corresponds to the elastic component. This part corresponds to the airway resistance. And this part of the equation corresponds to the peep volume. So you calculate the area by this, and then when you multiply it by respiratory rate, then you get mechanical power. So all in all, it is area under volume and area under pressure multiplied by respiratory rate. And this was mathematically expressed beautifully by Dr. Gattinoni in 2016. And when just you, uh, one sim simple look at the equation, we can say how much each component of the uh, equation is contributing to the energy or to the mechanical power. And as we can see, tidal volume flow and driving pressure contribute maximally to the mechanical power followed by respiratory rate and positive anti pressure, although contributes to mechanical power, but its contribution is much less as compared to what tidal volume flow and driving pressure are doing. And by this equation, we can also nicely explain how high peep and low tidal volume strategy in ARDS works. So at a low tidal volume, what we are actually doing is we are reducing the mechanical power significantly. And with low tidal volume, we also have a risk of atelic trauma. To prevent that, we increase the positive index fluid pressure. And by increasing the positive index fluid pressure, we will not increase mechanical power that much. And thus, we have a win-win situation and improve the outcome. So we have an energy to distend the lungs, to move the gas, and to keep the lungs open, which is ultimately getting multiplied by respiratory rate. And that is the important thing here. Each component, including driving pressure, can cause ventilator-induced lung injury. And this effect is amplified because of rate and duration. Girin actually gave us uh, uh, the cutoff values. They said that if you keep driving pressure less than 15 and mechanical power less than 12 joules per minute, you will have distinct possibilities of survival. Serpa Nito in their 88,000 plus patients gave us a cutoff value of 13 joules per minute for mechanical power in adults. There are different ways to calculate mechanical power, and they are going to be different in pressure control and volume control mode naturally because pressure control has deceleratory flow and volume control mode has a, a constant flow. Geometric method we already saw, taking area under pressure and volume multiplied by respiratory rate. They can calculate by different equations. One equation is comprehensive equation. These are usually lengthy and little complicated equations where the observer has to be standing at the bedside perform an inspiratory hole to calculate the numbers, while there is a surrogate equations. The so surrogate equations are easier to calculate and you don't need to stand at the bedside for inspiratory hole. That means retrospectively from the ventilator charts also, you can take the data and calculate mechanical power by surrogate equations. So this is a, a comprehensive equation given by Dr. Gattinoni for volume control mode. And it requires uh, to stand at the bedside and take an inspiratory hold. This is Giosa's equation, which is a surrogate equation. It does not uh, need you to stand at the bedside for inspiratory hold. 
and it is a it is for volume control mode for pressure control mode mesh din et al gave us this little complicated equation and it is a comprehensive equation that means you need to stand at the bedside for inspiratory hold uh, becker et al gave us uh, this uh, surrogate equation for pressure control mode that means you don't need to stand at the bedside for inspiratory hold and ultimately this particular paper is the most important uh, study they correlated all these equations and they found that gatunonis equation correlates very well with jusa's equation in volume control mode and uh, becker's equation is correlating quite well with mesdin equation in pressure control mode and this is a big relief for us clinicians that means we don't have to stand at the bedside and calculate mechanical power all the time we can retrospectively also calculate mechanical power by using surrogate equations so lungs can be protected by decreasing inspiratory if possible expiratory mechanical power optimizing driving pressure ensuring optimum rates and duration and also by trying to increase the lung homogeneity and the best available maneuver to encourage lung homogeneity is prone positioning so in this paper uh, published uh, in 2016 dr gatinoni had de demonstrated how proning helps uh, in such atelectatic lungs at the dependent parts when proning was performed you get such good ho lung homogeneity while in another patient at a positive index pressure of 5 such bad atelectatic lung when the peep was increased to 15 still lungs are not that greatly recruited so proning is a better strategy for recruitment as compared to just increasing positive and respiratory pressure thus application of mechanical power depends upon whether your lung is recruitable or not recruitable if your lung is recruitable then if you perform procedures like proning recruitment maneuver or good peep titration you will have better lung homogeneity and you will have lower driving pressure and plenty pressures Uh, to for the same delivered tidal volume and you will have less ventilator induced lung injury while if the lung is not recruitable the same things will not have any improvement in lung homogeneity you will have end up you will end up having high plenty pressures high driving pressures and more chance of lung injury so everything depends upon underlying lung condition and systemic illness now some pediatric considerations as we know most of the children are on pressure control or prvc modes so naturally we use becker surrogate equation in uh, children in pressure control mode and in this particular equation we have these two things respiratory rate and tidal volume these are the confounding factors because as the age increases respiratory rate will fall and tidal volume will go on increasing so like in adults you have a harmful threshold of 13 or 12 joules per minute given for mechanical power in children you can't have that because it is the normal mechanical power itself is changing with age and that's why uh, some uh, studies suggested using mechanical power per kg so take it per kg that is called normalized mechanical power or nor mp and this will mitigate the problem of tidal volume but still the problem of respiratory rate will still continue and to solve that dr martin neber came up with this solution in 2020 so what he did is instead of mechanical power he said we will calculate mechanical energy so they removed respiratory rate also from the equation and uh, took tidal volume as tidal volume per kg and calculated mechanical energy as we know the important integral part of mechanical power equation is respiratory rate everything all the volume has to be multiplied by respiratory rate to get mechanical power dr martin neber removed that and uh, he said that uh, in children this is the only strategy we can go forward with he actually showed that when mechanical power increases with age when you take mechanical energy it remains it does not change with age so probably then you can use this now uh, and find out some safe cut off values for children and then use it for ventilation i had a good fortune of uh, having uh, our rainbow children's hospitals data and uh, sharing with uh, none other than uh, dr lucian gatinani sir few months ago and he was thrilled to see uh, the data in pediatric age group and he was very happy to see our data this was our study dr shekhar sir is also part of our uh, uh, study this was a prospective study in around 200 patients where we collected the uh, uh, mechanical power in volume control and pressure control mode the tidal volumes using beckers and gatinonis equation and uh, the first striking thing is the lower numbers in normal lungs edematous lungs and restrictive lungs driving pressures are much lower in children compared to adult numbers when dr gatinoni saw this he also he was also very happy to see this he was saying he was expecting this because mechanical power required to ventilator a, a, a mouse will be much less compared to 
mechanical power used to ventilate an elephant, he said. And the second thing we, which we found is mechanical power or mechanical power per kg body weight, that is normalized mechanical power or mechanical energy. All of them significantly increased when the tidal volume increased from four to six ml per kg body weight. We also found that in pressure control mode, mechanical power increased with age as Dr. Martin Neighbor also showed. And mechanical power per kg uh, remained stable till 10 years. Then we saw, saw that there is a fall in mechanical power per kg uh, after the age of 10 years. This fall, because in mechanical power per kg, we have only mitigated the problem of tidal volume. Respiratory rate is still there. And after 10 years of age, we saw there is a significant fall in respiratory rate. And that may be the reason why MP per kg is falling after 10 years of age. And when we calculate mechanical energy, we did not see much change across all ages, just like Dr. Martin Neighbor uh, saw. In volume control mode also, we saw similar trend, mechanical power increasing with age, mechanical power per kg remaining stable till 10 years and then having a fall and mechanical energy not changing at all at all ages. We also found correlation between equations just like uh, uh, Chimulu. So uh, in mechanical power in volume control mode between Gattinoni and Giosa's equation correlated very well and mechanical energy also calculated as per Dr. Gattinoni's or Giosa's equation also correlated very well as per our study. To summarize, uh, we are now moving towards a new thing called personalized uh, ventilation uh, beyond going for, from lung protective ventilation. That means now we are supposed to ask ourselves, are we dealing with a focal ERDS or a non-focal ERDS, whether we have a less recruitable lung or more recruitable lung. As we discussed already, if you have a more recruitable lung, then your mechanical power will have less impact and uh, less chance of lung injury. Also, we saw that the more recruitable lung can be ventilated with little higher tidal volumes. And we also uh, saw that tidal volume per kg is not a good idea. Titrate tidal volume as per available respiratory compliance, that is go for driving pressure. We can also, uh, we need to titrate tidal volume and keep keeping in mind that amount of driving pressure, mechanical power, and use recruitment maneuver and pruning in carefully selected patients. Driving pressure and MP mechanical power are surrogates of ventilator in this lung injury. There is growing trends towards uh, driving pressure and mechanical power targeted uh, ventilation. And uh, there are now easier methodologies available to calculate mechanical power and they are evolving. But we need to understand that we still do not know whether mechanical power targeted or driving pressure targeted ventilation will actually improve the outcomes, particularly in pediatric age group. I will uh, conclude my talk by this last study, which was published just last month. And this is very interesting that now mind ray ventilator has come. It is calculating mechanical power by taking area under pressure and volume and multiplying by respiratory rate. And it displays mechanical power continuously on the screen. So what Kimulo et al did was they calculated mechanical power manually by using Gattinoni's and, uh, uh, Gattinoni's and Becker's equation in volume control and uh, pressure control ventilation in three different peeps and two different tidal volumes. And then they correlated with the mechanical power which was displayed on the ventilator screen. And they found that they are all correlating very well. And this is actually a new door being opened for all of us now. That means within few months to year, one or maximum one or two years, ventilators are going to continuously display mechanical energy or mechanical power on the screen. And as clinicians, we will have to learn quickly how to use those numbers and manage our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farhan. Thank you so much. That was uh, phenomenal. It's a huge amount of material uh, you covered in uh, just short of, uh, you know, about uh, 60 minutes or so. Um, and you covered the entire gamut, uh, starting with the basics and how to apply it clinically. Uh, are there any questions from anybody? There's one question on the chat. Uh, Shekhar, you have any comments on that? Uh, on the presentation, I think it was fantastic. And I really like some of the examples where he showed when you change things, how things change. But can I share a few slides? Sure, sir. Absolutely. <clears throat> Share screen. 
Can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. So not to put a damper on Farhan's talk, but Farhan explained things extremely well. But let me tell you my concern. My concern is uh, there are a lot of misconceptions about these concepts. So I just wanted to explain uh, in a way, maybe I'm wrong about this, but if something, somebody feels I'm wrong about this, please let's have a chat about it. The first <clears throat> equation that uh, Amado showed was uh, the static compliance of the respiratory system is tidal volume divided by P plateau minus P in volume control ventilation. Then he rearranged these Equ this equation, putting P plateau minus P on uh, is equal to VT divided by CRS and said that the tidal volume is indexed to the compliance of the patient, uh, of the respiratory system. This gives the impression that the P plateau minus P is actually can be an independent variable during volume control ventilation. That is not correct. Driving pressure is a dependent variable during volume control ventilation because pressure changes secondary to volume changes. Yes. Because of the change in compliance. So if the compliance stays fixed, a change in tidal volume will change the driving pressure, not the other way around. If the volume is fixed and your compliance changes, your driving pressure will change for that same tidal volume. True. So the driving pressure is a dependent variable. It's not an independent variable. Therefore, what you can manipulate is only the independent variable, not the dependent variable. During pressure control ventilation is slightly different. Assuming, like Farhan explained very nicely, if you allow sufficient inspiratory time so that the peak pressure is maintained for a longer period of time so that the tidal volume reaches a maximum and flow comes down to zero before the end of inspiration. If that is the case, then driving pressure is an independent variable because the volume changes because of the compliance change. So if you have a fixed volume, fixed compliance, and you change the driving pressure, which is PIP minus P, it will change the tidal volume, not the other way around. The tidal volume is dependent on, becomes a dependent variable in pressure control ventilation. But you have to allow sufficient eye time so that the flow comes down to zero. If you don't do that, then that relationship is not correct. And that Farhan explained very nicely. I think this is a very important concept to understand about this driving pressure. What Amato and the adults are talking about is driving pressure with pressure control ventilation, uh, with a volume control ventilation. It's not with pressure control ventilation. The second one, Farhan showed very nicely the safe zones and where you should have your pressures. There's a misconception about this particular loop. The loop that we are superimposing to try to teach safe zones, this loop is a static pressure volume loop. It is not the same as the ventilator graphic loops that you see on the screen. So in the static pressure volume loop, you are introducing aliquots of volume, measuring the pressure at different volumes and different pressure. So when you do that with to full inflation and full deflation, there is a point in deflation where the volume remaining in the lung is higher for the same pressure during deflation curve. And the theory is that if you apply a recruitment maneuver and apply the optimal PEEP, that it will circulate around that 
uh, deflation curve. But we don't know that for certain in every patient. And we don't know if that uh, uh, location of your optimal peep will stay at the same place over time. We don't know any of that stuff. So it's important to understand that this curve that people are projecting during teaching is a static pressure volume loop to try to make people understand how to ventilate and how to recruit the lung. It is not the same as the ventilator graphics loops. The third thing I want to show you is on the left-hand side is this complicated thing about mechanical power that Farhan beautifully explained. But it has two components. It has a pressure component for both compliance and resistance, and it has a volume component, and it has a third component, time, which is rate, which is the same as work of breathing. Yes. The work of breathing used to be calculated based on the area of the inspiration and expiration. They would calculate the total area in this uh, loop, multiply it by the number of times it happens. That is your tidal work of breathing. They have incorporated, they have changed the terminology to call it stress and strain to align itself to more material science damage. Uh, ventilator induced injury damage, which is a good concept to uh, explain. But people need to remember it, this is nothing but work of breathing. And right. the unit for work of breathe, work is joule. And if you do it per rate, it's joules per minute. It's, it's the same as mechanical power uh, uh, unit. So this is something that people need to understand. What mechanical power actually measures is the work done by the ventilator on the respiratory system. They're calling it mechanical power. They're calling it a combination of stress and strain, which is nothing but the work done on the lung. Misconception, conceptions about the studies. Most of the studies, as Farhan explained, are associative studies. They associate the driving pressure and mechanical power to outcomes does not mean that they are causative. That means right now, reduction of tidal volume will decrease both driving pressure and mechanical power. If you have eight ml per kilo and your driving pressure is 30, you reduce the tidal volume, your driving pressure will come down. So there is no need to independently focus on two things. One will come down as a result of the other. If you're on pressure control, you just reduce the DP, your tidal volume will come down. So people need to simplify the concepts in the brain, even though for explanatory purposes, they are making more detailed explanations. The last one, other than better understanding of the mechanisms of injury, my question today, and uh, Farhan very nicely explained at the end, Will manipulation of all the variables improve outcomes? We don't know. There are no studies to show that active manipulation of each one of these variables, which of these variables improves outcome. We know definitely tidal volume uh, management does improve outcome. Or put another way, there are tidal volumes that are, which are harmful. We don't know what is the most optimal tidal volume. If you take the ARDS network study, they did 12 ml and 6 ml per kilo. All that one can actually scientifically, if you are scientifically honest, all that one can say is that 12 ml per kilo is harmful, 6 ml per kilo is not harm, as harmful as 12 ml per kilo. That's all you can say. But we have taken that study and essentially said that Everybody in the world has to be ventilated with six ml per kilo. I think that is scientifically wrong. I think that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Shekhar. Uh, there are, uh, there was a very interesting talk and even more interesting discussion. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, just, I have one, one just piece of advice for all the people. Mm -hmm. 
go read the basic physiology of the lung and all that and try to apply this new physiology with the understanding of the old physiology. Don't think this is all just like Einstein's theory of general relativity and special relativity. It's not. It's actually much simpler than that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, thank you, Shekhar, for your insight, as always. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for attending uh, and staying for the hour and a half. Uh, I think it was well worth the uh, evening. Um, and so <clears throat> we can build on this by reading more. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, everybody. We, we have to talk for Han about the papers. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very soon. Okay. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Very Good night. nice. I like his slides. <laughs>